This hearing will come to order. And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. And before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note that today that the committee is being held virtually. And a couple of reminders to the members, please keep your video feed on as long as you're present in the hearing and you are responsible for your own microphone. So uh, obviously please keep them muted unless you're speaking. Finally, if you have documents that you wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. So good morning and welcome to today's hearing entitled, A Review of the Decadal Strategy for Planetary Science and Astrobiology, 2023 to 2032. Thank you to our distinguished witnesses for joining us today. Witnesses and authors and thinkers, and we're really excited to have you. Today, we're gonna to hear about the vision for the future of planetary science and astrobiology. And the vision is truly breathtaking. Returning samples from Mars, sending envoys to the ice giants of, uh, of Uranus and Saturn's moons, Enceladus, even infusing planetary science into human exploratory programs. These are just a few of the inspiring and ambitious activities organized around priority science questions that set the stage for a planetary decadal vision. Before I continue, I want to take a moment to thank the hundreds of scientists who've contributed to the decadal survey process. Um, I tried to read as much of it as I could, but I was astonished at how much science went into the process itself. And thank you to the committee that shepherded the survey and and of course, most importantly, the co-chairs who led this, who put all this together, who are with us today, the once in a decade undertaking. Decadal surveys obviously require enormous effort. They've got to reach a consensus on priorities and make hard choices about how to achieve a bold scientific vision within the realities of a finite budget. And while the vision inspires, it's the hard work, taxpayer investments, and people who turn that vision into reality. For the first time, this decadal survey makes important recommendations on the state of the profession, including and especially diversity, equity, and inclusion. Ensuring broad access and participation in implementing this decadal is central to its success. So I want to voice my strong support for breaking barriers and opening doors so that all of America's talent can be part of this exciting future in planetary science. The United States, with our international partners, has reveled in a golden age of planetary science that has allowed us to send probes to every planet in the solar system, to send spacecraft to the surface of Mars on three separate occasions in just the last decade, and to sample the asteroid Bennu. There's much more to come as NASA and the community develop missions that will study Earth's fiery neighbor Venus and send an orbiter into to Europa and deploy a rotorcraft on the hydrocarbon world of Titan. And as we look to the future, we can't rest on our past successes. Maintaining US leadership requires that we hew to the carefully crafted strategy laid out in the decadal survey. Maintain balance, manage costs, embrace innovation, and ensure a talented pipeline. And it's up to us in Congress to make those necessary investments. Really, we can't afford not to. If we want this nation to lead in some in answering some of the most consequential questions for humanity, are we alone? Is there life beyond our planet? Are there near Earth objects on a trajectory headed toward Earth? And how will human presence in deep space affect our understanding of the solar system? So I wanna thank again our witnesses for being here today. I'm eager to hear your testimony. And I'd now like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the, into the record a letter from the American Astronomical Society. And if there are no objections, I will so order it. And now let me recognize my friend, Dr. Babin from Texas for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate this. Looking forward to this hearing. Um, and uh, I see my, my uh, ranker on there, uh, Mr. Lucas, thank you uh, very much. And uh, really appreciate all of you. Looking forward to uh, hearing this expert testimony. Uh, I'd also like to thank our esteemed witnesses for appearing today. The decadal survey process is no small feat. Not only is the subject complex from a scientific and technological standpoint, but from an organizational and coordination and that those aspects are just as daunting. Uh, the task of producing a consensus position among brilliant minds uh, that informs the next decade of investments in cutting edge exploration cannot be understated. 
Many of us on Capitol Hill are accustomed to the day-to-day -day realities of politics, but the decadal process reminds me of the old joke that academic uh, politics is the most vicious and bitter form of politics because the stakes are so low. Uh, I disagree. Uh, the stakes for planetary science are high. The issues that we are discussing influence norms of behavior and space for future generations. The goals we set inspire our children and our grandchildren to pursue challenging fields of study like science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The technologies that we develop to enable these discoveries enable our economic and national security. And that's why the work that you do is so very important. The task set before you should be fully appreciated. The questions, destination, and concepts that you evaluated and prioritized were vast and very, very complex. And they involve not only planetary science, but also cost estimation, management, budget formulation, supply chain risk, international relations, national security, market analysis, and many, many other aspects that are so critical to a successful portfolio of programs. Previous decadal surveys initiated missions that inspired all and piqued our curiosity and drew front page attention as the world's, on the world's newspapers and nightly news features. From roving and flying on Mars to sampling asteroids and returning dramatic images of distant Pluto, planetary science missions capture our imaginations and beckon us to explore farther into the cosmos. This decadal survey continues that tradition. In addition to reaffirming support for a Mars sample return mission and a Europa mission, it also recommends a mission to Uranus, a mission to Saturn's moon, Enceladus, and calls for a lunar rover mission to collect large samples over long distances and then deliver them to the Artemis astronauts for an eventual return here to Earth. The report also provides important support for a near Earth object survey mission to identify potentially hazardous asteroids that could impact Earth and have catastrophic effects on all of us. The recommendation to fully support the development, timely launch, and subsequent operation of the NASA, or excuse me, of the NEO surveyor mission is particularly important as NASA proposes to slash the NEO surveyor mission budget and even reprogram existing appropriated funds from the current fiscal year. These missions recommended by the report will advance science, maintain global leadership, and protect our precious planet. Bold and ambitious plans are important. As we saw over the last two years, China successfully landed a rover on Mars and returned samples from the moon. Their plans are very ambitious. Our, our should be even more so, more ambitious, but we must be vigilant in how we implement these, re these recommendations and to carry out these plans. To the Academy's credit, they also recommended alternative programs of funding, if, if funding is not available, to support their aspirational goals. This will enable NASA and Congress to make informed decisions throughout the decade. As we've seen over the years, these decision criteria are important to have when difficult decisions have got to be made. In order to turn these recommendations into a reality, we must ensure strong program management and of, above all accountability. Cost overruns impact other missions and programs within the division and can delay future missions. We can't afford to have one program eat the lunch, so to speak, of other important activities. And that's why Congress will have to closely examine the recommendation to alter the cost caps for discovery and new frontier class missions. I'm also interested in better understanding the panel's thoughts on how to limit the risk of international participation cost overruns and schedule delays for the Mars sample return mission, as well as the panel's thoughts on how to best use NASA's current astro material curation facilities at the Johnson Space Center for Mars samples. I proudly represent Johnson Space Center. Well, once again, I wanna thank you for your service and your time today, and I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Babin, thank you very, very much. Yes, sir. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Congressman Lucas. If 
Uh, Congressman Lucas, as ranking member, would like to offer any opening statements. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the courtesy, but I'm enthusiastically waiting for our panel, so I will pass. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Congressman Lucas. Uh, so in the absence of our major chair, let me now introduce our witnesses. Dr. Robin Canup um, is Assistant Vice President at Southwest Research Institute, where she leads the Planetary Sciences Directorate in Boulder, Colorado. Um, Dr. Canup is a theoretician. That she studies the formation, the early evolution of planets and their moons. She's modeled many aspects of the formation of the moon and has also developed models for an impact origin of the satellites of Pluto and Mars. Another major area of Dr. Kenneth's work has addressed the origin of the systems of rings and satellites around the outer giant planets. Dr. Kenup is the co-chair of the 2023 to 2032 Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey. That's why she's here. And she earned her PhD and, and Master of Science in Astrophysics and Planetary Sciences from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, doctor, it's wonderful to have you here. It's so rare to have anything good come out of Colorado that uh, it's really terrific. So, uh, Dr. Philip Christensen is the Regents Professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. His interest, research interest focuses on the composition, processes, and physical properties of Mars, Earth, asteroids, Europa, and other planetary surfaces. Dr. Christensen has built seven science instruments that have flown on NASA's Mars Observer, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, Mars Exploration Over, Rover, OSIRIS-REx, and Lucy missions, and the UAE's Hope Mars Orbiter. He is also the co-chair of the 2023-2032 Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey. Dr. Christensen received his PhD in geophysics and space physics from the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, so as, as your witness note, you will have each five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony, uh, much longer, will be included in the record of the hearing. And when you've completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with uh, these rigorous questions. And each member will have five minutes to question the panel. So with that, uh, we'll start with Dr. Robin Knup, and I hope you will tell us how to correctly pronounce your name. That is correct, and thank you for the very kind introductions. Uh, good morning, Chairman Beyer, Ranking Member Babin, and members of the subcommittee. We are deeply appreciative of the opportunity to speak to you today about our decadal report, and perhaps we could bring up the first slide. Ten years ago, Dr. Stephen Squires came here and argued for an ambitious program of planetary exploration. Thanks to the generosity of Congress, that program became a reality and ushered in a decade of unprecedented success. Our sample return in Europa Clipper are now underway and will revolutionize our understanding of the early habitable Martian environment and of the habitability of an icy ocean world. These flagship missions have been accompanied by a vibrant program of missions at varied cost levels, as well as new partnerships between NASA and the private sector that are increasing access to space and its affordability. Against this backdrop of incredible accomplishments, and with awareness of efforts being undertaken by other space agencies around the world, we put forth an aspirational plan for the next decade to ensure groundbreaking scientific advances, as well as our nation's continued leadership in solar system exploration. Next slide, please. We begin our task by defining uh, the most important scientific questions that motivate our endeavors, which fall within three scientific themes. And next slide, please. The first theme, Origins addresses how the primordial disk of gas and solids that orbited our young sun evolved to yield the outer giant planet systems and Kuiper belt objects and the inner asteroids and terrestrial planets, including our own Earth-Moon system. Next slide. The second theme, worlds and processes, considers ongoing gravitational interactions and bombardment. The interiors, surfaces, atmospheres, and climates of solid planets the properties of gas-dominated Jupiter and Saturn, as well as the ice giants Uranus and Neptune, and the many diverse systems of moons and rings. Next slide. The third theme, life and habitability, addresses how life on Earth emerged and evolved, other habitable environments across the solar system, and the central question of whether life formed elsewhere and how to detect evidence of it. Related to all these themes is the study of planets orbiting other stars, which can help us better understand whether Earth-like planets are common or rare in the universe. Answering such fundamental questions requires a highly skilled and creative workforce. Next slide, please. 
Broad access and participation, as well as equitable processes, are needed to recruit, retain, and nurture the best talent to work in our field. Our report makes numerous recommendations to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion in our profession, including actions to minimize the effect of biases in our processes, to enhance outreach to underrepresented communities, and to foster respectful and inclusive work environments. It is basic research and analysis that provides the intellectual foundation that ensures that NASA's activities are optimized to advance scientific knowledge. In addition, the openly competed RNA programs support broad access and entry into our profession. While NASA's planetary program has grown substantially in the past decade, the per year fractional investment in basic RNA has decreased from 14% in 2013 to less than 8% currently. It is essential to the continued success of our nation's planetary science program that this trend be reversed and that a minimum of 10% of the annual program budget be invested into RNA. Turning now to missions, the committee reaffirms the broad scientific and strategic importance of Mars sample return and recommends that it be completed as soon as is practically possible as the highest priority of NASA's robotic exploration efforts. One of the most exciting new missions recommended in our report involves increased cooperation between NASA's science and human exploration endeavors. The Artemis program calls for landing humans on the moon starting in the 2020s with increasingly sustained operations on the lunar surface. The committee strongly supports this visionary program and argues that it is imperative that Artemis be accompanied by a similarly visionary scientific program. To not do so would be a missed opportunity for NASA and the nation that would undermine the tremendous potential value of the Artemis program. To that end, we prioritize a transformative mission a robotic human partnership we call Endurance A. This lunar rover mission would complete a thousand kilometer, 300 mile traverse across the South Pole Aiken Basin of the moon on the moon's far side, collecting a large suite of samples along the way. The rover would then deliver these samples to a location on the lunar surface for return to earth by Artemis astronauts. This mission would revolutionize our understanding of the moon and the history of the early solar system recorded in its oldest impact base, basin. Thank you for the invitation to testify and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Canoe, very much. Um, we're, I'm looking forward to our questions too. Uh, Dr. Christensen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chairman Beyer, Ranking Member Babin and distinguished members of the committee. It is indeed a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you today. Uh, one of the key tasks that our committee was given was to prioritize the large flagship planetary missions that NASA should undertake in the coming decade. As you just heard from Dr. Knupp, there's a remarkable array of science questions that we wish to answer, and the flagship missions provide the best means to make fundamental progress towards doing so. We selected the Uranus Orbiter and Probe as our highest priority flagship. Uranus is an ice giant that has far more ice and rock than the gas giants of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. The ice giants may be among the most common planets in the universe, and yet they remain the only planets in our solar system that have never been studied in detail. Uranus is an intriguing body whose low internal energy, atmospheric dynamics, and complex magnetic fields present major puzzles. It's unclear when and where Uranus formed. It may have actually swapped positions with Neptune during early solar system migration. And finally, Uranus's largest icy moon are potential um, ocean worlds in themselves. The next slide, please. Our second priority flagship is the Enceladus Orbiter and Lander. Enceladus is an icy moon of Saturn with active plumes that bring water from the subsurface ocean to the surface where we can study them. Orby Lander will address one of our most fundamental questions. Is there life beyond Earth? The Cassini spacecraft detected methane, ammonia, and other simple organics in the plumes, but could not measure the complex molecules associated with life. Orby Lander will spend two years on the surface beneath an active plume and study that ocean material as it rains down upon the lander. Our committee also evaluated more than 25 medium class or New Frontiers uh, missions and prioritized the most promising candidates. New Frontiers missions are competitively selected and provide the science community with the opportunity 
to bring forward their most innovative concepts. From this amazing set, we selected nine themes. Uh, the these uh, missions include sample returns from a comet to study the role comets play in delivering water and organics to Earth, and a mission to Ceres, a large ice-rich asteroid, to study its formation and habitability. Another mission would land and orbit on a primitive ice-rich centaur asteroid, and, a, and another would probe into Saturn. Together, these would improve our understanding of giant planet formation and the composition and nature of the early solar nebula. Our set of missions also includes a network of landers on the moon to gain insight into its origin and interior state, and a mission to Venus to investigate its atmosphere and, and how that interacts with the surface. Finally, there are missions to the amazing and complex ocean worlds of Enceladus, Titan, and Triton in order to assess their habitability and to search for evidence of life. Planetary defense is an international, next slide, please. Uh, planetary defense, is an international enterprise aimed at providing protection to the people of the world from devastating asteroid and comet impacts. Advancement in planetary defense will require enhancements in asteroid detection and characterization and the ability to rapidly assess newly identified hazards. We recommend that NASA fully support the development and timely launch of the NEO surveyor to achieve the highest priority goal of asteroid detection and characterization. In summary, our report outlines a portfolio of activities that will significantly advance the frontiers of planetary science and astrobiology in the coming decade. Our recommended program defines an integrated suite of flight projects, research activities, and technology development that will produce transformative advances in our knowledge. This program is balanced across missions of different sizes and destinations and includes key recommendations for cooperation with NASA's Human Exploration Program, as well as US industry and international partners. The recommended program is both aspirational and inspirational and enables the robust training of a diverse science and engineering workforce, drives technology, and maintains strong US leadership in space exploration across the solar system. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Dr. Christensen, thank you very much. We now begin a round of questions. Um, I will begin. Dr. Kanup, you talk about a minimum of 10% of the annual program in, in research and analysis activities. Uh, how do you differentiate that from um, what NASA is doing overall? How, it, is this, um, I, I'm trying to for this differentiate between, is this, planning flag missions versus trying to understand what, exactly what's going on? Um. So the RNA program has several parts. One is data <laughs> analysis, essentially, taking the data produced from our missions and analyzing, determining essentially what it means. A second part uh, involves basic research to develop new hypotheses based on that data and new ways to test those ideas. And then the third element is really developing the conceptual underpinnings for future endeavors. Based on what we know, what are the new questions? What are the instruments and techniques and measurements needed to address those? And what are the next suite of missions uh, uh, to uh, you know, address those questions? So the RNA program, which is largely uh, done through relatively small, highly competitive individual investigator grants, serves all of those roles within the portfolio. And that's just making sure that we understand all the data that we've gathered through these big experiments. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. There. Yeah. and, and synthesizing that data into an actual uh, uh, rethinking of um, uh, these questions and um, our understanding of the solar system at large. Yeah. You, you talked about the 1,000 kilometer traverse across the South Pole Aiken Basin which reminded me of all the stuff we've read about people who went to the South Pole in the first part here in the, in the in, on this planet, Ronald Amundsen and the like. Will there be human beings in that or is that could be just a robotic rover? So the rover itself will be robotic. The plan would be to land it through a CLIPS delivery service on the moon and the complete traverse, much like our traverses on the surface of Mars, would be robotically driven. 
but then ultimately it will bring back the samples to a location where the astronauts can return them to Earth. I have a friend who's a retiring congressman from Colorado who would like to drive that rover on the thousand kilometer mission. <laughs> um, Dr. Christensen, um, I was fascinated by all the many things we both have offered, but the planetary defense, you know, in a world with climate change and a world where uh, we've had the threat of nuclear war, um, we're very aware of the extinction events that asteroids have caused in the past. Um, is there enough attention being paid to the possibility of asteroid hits and the awareness of what it could do to life on Earth? Um, there's certainly a lot of a lot of research on that, and we know a lot. And we've we've characterized the largest objects that could hit the Earth. But what we need to understand is the next uh, range, the 50 to 150 meter size, that could cause significant damage on the Earth. And that is the class. We know there's a lot of them out there and we're still in the process of trying to identify them. And we have a long ways to go. And so, and so we, we strongly recommend that we complete that characterization just so that we know what the threat is and then we can begin to uh, do something about that threat if it turns out to that uh, something's gonna hit in the near future. Thank you. you know, uh, one thing I love about this job is I learn amazing new things every day. How did you, ever, you guys ever figure out that Uranus and Neptune may have switched positions. I'll leave that to Robin. <laughs> so so it, it turns out that, um, uh, you know, the early models for the origin of the solar system, we presumed that the planets formed largely in their current orbits where we see them today. And over time, we've, bec uh, we've grown to appreciate that as planets form within these primordial disks around their star, their orbits migrate. They move a lot. And as we've built models that incorporate those migration effects, many of them involve substantial migration of the outer planets. And we see evidence of that migration in the properties of the Kuiper Belt object directly. And a lot of those models that produce solar systems that look most like our own actually start with five ice giants in our outer, or five gas uh, giants in the outer, I'm sorry, five gas planets in the outer solar system with three ice giants and often eject one and Uranus and Neptune end up changing places. So these are some of the theoretical models that we try to track, we try, we try to test with uh, various types of constraints. Great, Th thank you very much. Fascinating, fascinating work. Um, I am instructed that our, our next questioner will be the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, continuing along the discussion about the near earth objects, and I would address my questions to the panel, whoever, whoever is appropriate we care to answer. In 2005, Congress tasked NASA to identify 90% of the 140 meter potential hazard near earth objects by 2020. NASA missed the deadline and remains years away from achieving that goal. But observations from the National Science Foundation's Rubin Observatory, coupled with a new space-based infrared mission, uh, have accelerated that survey. And additionally, NASA established the Planetary Defense Coordination Office in 2016 to help coordinate their efforts for planetary defense. However, NASA's 20, FY23 budget request cuts and delays the space-based infrared mission, known as NEO Surveyor. Your report, along with the previous uh, 2019 report from the Academy, recommends maintaining that NEO Surveyor mission. Should Congress allow NASA to reduce funding from FY22 appropriations for the NEO surveyor? I ask you a nice question. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh, clearly, our report strongly endorsed that mission. Uh, we spent a lot of time discussing it, and the, uh, the, the consensus was very much that this is an important mission. It's crucial to the people here on the Earth. We need to understand and identify these objects. And so we, we clearly uh, strongly endorse it and would continue to urge NASA and Congress to, to ensure that, that that mission gets funded and, and, and launched in a timely fashion. So that obviously means my next question about should Congress maintain funding for the NEO surveyor in 2023 is an obvious yes, I would assume. Yes, we, we think that it needs to happen and it should happen quickly. Thank you. The report also indicates that the Mars sample return mission cost grows more than 20%, if the mission cost grows more than 20% above the $5.3 billion estimate, 
or to more than 35% of the Planetary Science Division's budget in any given year. NASA should seek uh, budget augmentation. That's a really polite way to put that. A budget augmentation to cover the cost rather than take money from other planetary science efforts. Uh, where should that augmentation come from other than NASA? Uh, uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, we spent a lot of time. One of the, as one of you mentioned, one of the big concerns that the planetary science community has is that these large missions grow in cost and complexity, and they begin to dominate and upset the balance of missions across the portfolio. And so rather than uh, impact other planetary science missions, our report recommends that this portfolio be maintained and that, and that money be uh, found elsewhere. Now, obviously that's a difficult task. We didn't go into where that, that money should come from, but we were trying to maintain the integrity of a balanced program. Absolutely, and I appreciate that completely. And you can imagine in Congress, our discussion uh, of where such funds would come from. I mean, we're going to look at, at non-NASA science and technology activities. You know, there are things, energy, environment, basic research, just a variety of things. Uh, but, but I appreciate that. Last if question. I may, add, oh, if, oh, if I may add quickly, we also considered the strategy of uh, delaying the overall mission to reduce the per year cost, but felt that ultimately that increases the total cost. Um, and so that was not uh, the uh, recommendation of the report accordingly. Absolutely. NASA is increasingly leveraging novel ways to acquire science data, such as data buys, hosted payloads, ride shares, CubeSats. Uh, can you speak to the merits and risks of these approaches of acquiring additional science data? Uh, sure. We, uh, we talk in the report uh, about the important role of some of the uh, smaller uh, CubeSat-like programs. Simplex is uh, one example of that. These are programs that, by, by their nature, uh, can respond nimbly. nimbly. They can uh, tolerate more risk which allows us to develop new technologies. And so we see those as playing, playing a key role. Uh, we encourage the use of uh, these small missions and ride shares uh, to flexibly accommodate uh, additional science and te technology development as budget profiles allow. Um, in terms of data buys, there are definitely some areas uh, where those may be relevant. I don't think we speak too much to that in the report, but Phil can add if I'm if I'm mistaken on that. No, you're not. So it is fair to say that sometimes these novel approaches have the potential of helping NASA carry out their priorities in the overall decadal survey. So things worth looking at. Thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, very much. Now let me recognize the distinguished congressman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. All right, I was gonna say go buffs, and that's, I will say go buffs, and I'll say no offense to the Sun Devils. Um, I guess my question, and this is to my um, colleagues, um, you know, you talked, Dr. Knupp, about the overall percentage of the RNA or the research budget, uh, the science budget, planetary science has shrunk. It's grown, but it's shrunk compared to the rest. Um, in terms of the Artemis program, uh, you also mentioned that you didn't feel there was enough science being uh, integrated into the system. So can you talk to me a little bit about where you see these budget constraints and can you talk to me about what uh, needs to be done to do some more science in the Artemis mission? And then I've got an idea where there's more money to be found that I wanna talk to my colleagues about. Sure. Uh, so right now, our assessment is you have the Artemis program uh, being uh, defined and driven naturally by the Human Exploration Directorate. And there is consideration about what opportunistic science, in a sense, might be done along with those plans. What we emphasize is that that kind of add-on approach of science is probably unlikely to produce truly transformative science that we think is worthy of this program and the historic level of investment that is gonna be associated with it. So 
What we argue for in the report is that uh, there needs to be some type of structure organizationally within NASA that gives the science mission directorate and particularly the planetary science division. They currently have the responsibility for executing lunar science, but they don't have the authority to implement any requirements on the Artemis program. And so the report argues that the organizational structure needs to be uh, needs to evolve so as to give the science director at NASA that authority to, and to actually have a true integration of the requirements from both human exploration and science. And we make some suggestions, um, although we're not overly prescriptive on that, we, we leave it up to NASA to address this, but we make some suggestions such as uh, a, um, a new entity at the associate administra uh, administrator level in NASA that would be in charge of coordinating the different directorates that are all involved um, in the Artemis endeavor. And so that's, uh, that's the type of recommendation we make there. In terms of the RNA program, uh, we incorporate that recommended 10% level investment. We see that in the same way a private company will allocate a certain amount of its budget to investment in uh, its future development, NASA should be investing a, a, a fixed percentage we see in its analysis of data and its future uh, development as well. So we incorporate that in, in our budget plans and uh, we, we get to that increase by a progressive ramp up uh, in the first few years of the decade. So hopefully right. that- well, Guess what I was gonna suggest because uh, I wanna see the science integrated here and that really is NASA's mission and obviously your mission in putting this report together Part of what's going on with Artemis, and, and this also applies to you know, future operations uh, that include Mars, is that there's a, a national security component to all of this that is taking up part of the budget. And so to my friend from Oklahoma, I don't see this as really a zero sum game within NASA, but we need to have our security uh, parts of the budget uh, to participate in this. So NASA can do its science and isn't having to front national security money uh, as part of this whole program. So I've spoken to Adam Smith and others about integrating some of the defense sums, which to the scientists, I'm sorry that we might integrate some, some uh, national defense money in here, but we need to do that to cover the cost of the program. And it would only be appropriate because that's what we're doing. I'll, I don't know if we're gonna get to do a second round, but I have lots of questions about the use of the Webb telescope for sort of this planetary uh, study uh, that we have. And I'm curious uh, what, the re what you all thought about that. And I'll yield back to the chair, uh, but please don't be bashful when I'm gone to talk to the defense folks about some money for this. Goodbye, I'll, I'll yield. Yeah, thank you, Congressman Perlmutter. And it is my intention to do a second round as long as we have enough people hanging around. And with that, let me introduce our, our ranking member, Dr. Brian Beck. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I really appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the U.S. taxpayer made significant investments in the Astro Materials Acquisition and Curation Office at the Johnson Space Center for past and future sample return missions. This includes the documentation, preservation, and preparation of samples from the moon, asteroids, comets, solar wind, and the planet Mars. Uh, their highest priority is to secure the uh, future availability of these samples for the worldwide scientific community. Understanding that Mars sample return mission may require additional capabilities, should NASA leverage those existing capabilities rather than starting from scratch and building a new facility. I'd like to hear what each, each of you has to say there. Thank you. I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, the, re the report is very, uh, very uh, focused on uh, creating the minimum uh, facility to receive the samples. These are samples that may have life or, or, or orga organics in them. So we have to treat them very carefully, but we make the recommendation that that initial receiving facility be the bare minimum necessary to verify that the samples are safe to then distribute to the scientific community. 
And that's the real key part, to get them out to the community. So we advocate not building a new facility with a lot of, a lot of capability, but the, the minimum needed to, to do that um, biocontainment and biohazard uh, detection. We also argue uh, strongly that NASA needs a plan for how to uh, curate these, uh, these samples. We weren't specific in uh, where that uh, curation should occur, but we clearly uh, expect NASA to do a, a very careful evaluation and do what's the, the most, uh, makes the most sense is the most cost-effective way of providing the long-term curation. And the, the Houston facility is obviously a, a, a very strong candidate. Thank you for saying that. Okay, any, any, any how about you, uh, uh, Ms. Robin? So the, the, the key is assess the safety of the samples as quickly and cost efficiency as you can, efficiently as you can and get them to a curation facility to start having them accessible by the scientists. This is the legacy of that program, this amazing sample set. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Next question, international partnerships are a, a very important aspect of, our, of these scientific missions. Uh, but when international partners are placed on the critical path for missions, it often leads to delays, as we've seen, and cost overruns. We saw this with the Mars InSight lander, the European Service module, the first module for the International Space Station, and many other instances. Uh, should NASA plan on international partners providing key elements for the Mars sample return mission? And if so, what should NASA do to mitigate the risk of these partner delays and overruns. Uh, and if delays and overruns are caused by international partners, what should the planetary science division cut in order to manage the division's uh, overall budgets? Um, uh, one, one of the, the key elements of the Mars sample return is that it is a very modular approach. Uh, so for example, we currently have a rover, rover collecting and caching samples. There'll be another lander that, uh, that contains the ascent vehicle. And the Europeans are currently building uh, the return orbiter that would bring those uh, samples uh, back to Earth. The nice thing about that architecture is that if there are delays in any of the elements, the architecture is, uh, can still go forward. So for example, if we put the cache in orbit around Mars and there were delays or, or difficulties with that return orbiter, they can stay in orbit for a long period of time. And so it's, they're a key partner, but they're not uh, on the critical path in the sense that the mission would fail if, if that partnership didn't come forward. So I think that is the type of partnership that, that actually works really well. And there have been, there have been good success cases like the Huygens probe on Cassini and um, uh, where these partnerships have worked really well and, of course, help to balance the sometimes sizable cost of these total endeavors. All right, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm going to try to get one more in here. The Decadal recommends increasing the cost cap for Discovery class missions from $500 million to $800 million and New Frontiers class missions from $1.31 billion to $1.6 billion. Um, uh, inflation was 2.4% annually over the period of the last decadal. Did launch vehicle costs go up or down over the last 10 years? I thought they went down. Did spacecraft costs go up or down over the last 10 years? So the, uh, I'll take this one. So the launch vehicle costs, thankfully, have generally gone down, largely due right. to uh, involving the private sector. Uh, in the last decade, uh, the cost structure for the Discovery and New Frontiers uh, missions with those prior cost caps was changed. So the cost cap only applied on essentially development through launch, and it did not include the operations phase, what you do when you're actually at your target. So in our new enlarged cost caps, we once again include all the phases in the cap. So the intent here is to try to get the cost cap back in line with what the true life cycle cost for these missions is turning out to be. And so when we look at the recent missions selected at both Discovery and New Frontiers, even though their cost caps were different, their life cycle costs are consistent with the cost cap structure we propose in the report this time. Okay, 
Thank you very much. And I see Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. I appreciate uh, the information and uh, I will yield back. Thank you, Dr. Babin. Now we now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Posey. Uh, thank you, Chairman Beyer. And uh, appreciate you holding this hearing on what is arguably the uh, most enjoyable committee in all of Congress. Uh, Dr. Canop and Dr. Christensen, you can alternate back on these. I just, I have three questions really, four, maybe four. Uh, what would you recommend NASA and the National Science Foundation do to create a close relationship so that their ground-based observations can be leveraged more effectively uh, to ensure goals are being met? Sure, I'll take that one. The report talks about uh, how important those ground-based facilities are to solar system research, not just to um, astronomy and astrophysics overall, um, as well as the future facilities as well. Um, one of the key NSF NASA recommendations in the report is that currently it is uh, not straightforward to fund projects of mutual interest. So in other words, there are funding mechanisms through NSF or through NASA, but there are often uh, projects of mutual interest. And we recommend that those agencies work together to try to develop structures to support those endeavors. And then we talk a lot in the report about um, how observations from those ground-based facilities, how ALMA observations are revolutionizing our understanding of how our solar system formed by looking at forming solar systems around other stars, for example. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about the key science that those facilities will bring and that recommendation uh, related to increased uh, coordination. With the loss of SIBO Observatory, which was important for hazardous asteroid characterization, how would a more formalized collaboration possibly assist in helping uh, with the near-Earth near Earth orbit survey, uh, which is required by law? Um, we, the report discusses uh, Arecibo, um, and we, rather than you know, come up with a specific recommendation on what should be done, we emphasize that NASA and NSF need to work together to develop a plan to re replace the capabilities that were lost uh, at Arecibo. Not necessarily a new facility, but for example, how could existing facilities be enhanced or augmented to get back that capability. And so we, we recognize it's, a, it's fundamental to the study of asteroids, near Earth objects, and we encourage uh, those agencies to, to come up with a plan uh, to do that. Uh, should we develop and launch an asteroid mitigation spacecraft in advance of a threat so we could rapidly respond if a hazardous asteroid is detected? So in our report, we recommend that after NEO surveyor, which is the survey mission, that the next highest priority planetary uh, defense mission should be what we call a, a rapid flyby reconnaissance mission. So we think the next step is to develop the ability to do a rapid mission flyby to characterize a threat that we just learned about. So an object that we just got an orbit on, that we just found out existed, we're ready to launch a, a craft to fly by to get a characterization which is the key information you need in order to decide on a mitigation technique uh, to implement. And of course, the DART mission is, um, uh, is going to later this year uh, attempt one of those mitigation techniques, right? A, a direct impact into an asteroid to look at the, you know, the kinetic deflection method for changing um, an orbit's trajectory. Uh, do you think there should be a formal agreement between NASA and the U.S. Space Command to exchange information concerning near-Earth objects uh, to ensure that future capabilities can discover objects in cis lunar space? Uh, we did not address that particular uh, issue or, or discuss uh, those types of, 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 of interactions. Uh, clearly, we talk in the report about the importance of uh, involving as many agencies as possible and as many international uh, uh, partners as possible, but we did not get into the, the specifics of that particular uh, relationship. Well, thank you. I, I see my time is about to expire. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Posey. May I recognize the Congressman from Florida, Governor Christ. Thank you, uh, Chairman Beyer. It's uh, great to be with you this morning and 
And I wanna thank our witnesses, Dr. Knupp and Dr. Christensen. While NASA's science programs can sometimes be overshadowed by flashy human exploration goals, I believe that too often they go in hand, hand in hand rather. This question is for either uh, of the two of you. Can you discuss how NASA's human exploration program known as Artemis could help to meet some of the science priorities laid out in this latest uh, survey? And what actions could NASA take to more effectively merge its science missions with Artemis program? Sure, I'll be happy to take that. So the, the Endurance A rover mission that we <clears throat> talked about, uh, the goal here is to really do a thorough exploration of the far side of the moon that uh, we haven't, uh, you know, that that's not um, that's not represented by the samples that were returned from the Apollo set. The far side of the moon is generally older, and in, and in in particular, this enormous South Pole Aiken Basin is thought to be the oldest impact large crater on the moon. So, what those samples that the rover will collect will do first is it will constrain what we think was the very heavy bombardment rate the very early solar system, the first half billion to billion years of Earth's history, when we think life was evolving, it'll tell us, it'll constrain that bombardment rate. That also in turn constrains the models of how the solar system formed that we talked about earlier that involved the giant planet migration of orbits because that migration drives, or we think drove big impacts into the inner solar system. So Artemis, or Artemis with this Endurance A component the rover would not only be able to date the SPA basin, but also date the old basin impacts that are superimposed on it. We don't have any samples of the moon's mantle, the interior of the moon, in either our meteoritic or our Apollo sample. They're all from the crust. We think the most likely place to find samples of the lunar mantle, again, is on the far side, exposed by this big impact basin. Um, the rover would also be uh, searching for and acquiring those samples. Those will tell us about the bulk composition of the moon. That constrains the origin of the Earth-Moon system. And finally, there's a big asymmetry in uh, the geology and the, even the shape of the, of the moon's far side versus the near side. And there's a lot of fundamental geology and questions that relate to the origin of that asymmetry that those samples will also address. And, and like the Apollo sample set, this sample set from Endurance A would be this incredible hundreds of kilogram legacy, not just for these science questions that we envision now, but also for future generations and techniques that we haven't even conceptualized yet. Um, so how to do this, right? And the fundamental you know, challenge is always how to integrate science into the human exploration plans. These are two independently appropriated directorates. They have different goals. Uh, we acknowledge these challenges in the report. Uh, we make suggestions about uh, aspects of how the organization needs to work, that the responsibility and authority to implement science needs to be uh, coherent in the organizational structure to make these top priority science goals happen. So when we land, we don't just get the sample from the site where we landed, we get this incredible sample set selected carefully over the whole surface of the moon. Um, there's the suggestion I mentioned of a, a new um, entity at the AA level to coordinate and make this happen. But again, we, we tried to not be overly prescriptive in uh, telling NASA how to achieve the needed management structure, but rather to focus on um, the principles that the management structure needs to reflect in order to be effective. Thank you. Um, Dr. Christensen, I'm curious, uh, can you discuss what priorities laid out in the decadal survey? Am I saying that word right? Decadal? Decadal? What does that mean? One decade. <laughs> oh, a decade. Okay, great. Yeah. And this one decade survey <laughs> can only be accomplished by sending humans to the surface of the moon and or Mars, like in 2033, Ed? Um, so I'm a geologist, um, and uh, you know it's amazing what a human can do uh, in a very short amount of time. And so I think all of us eventually want to see human explorers, scientists, astronauts on the moon, on Mars, doing what humans are really good at, making quick decisions, uh, working you know very very intelligently. Um, and so what what we really hope to see is a, a integration of NASA's spectacular robotic program with this inspirational human exploration program and bring those two together. 
because uh, there are humans are hard to keep alive and safe, but they can do a, a, incredible things once they get. There. So hopefully these, this, this will eventually be the goal that we'll learn enough from robots that it's safe and effective to send humans. Great, doctor, thank you very much. I, I appreciate both of you this morning and uh, Chairman Byer, thank you for the opportunity and I yield back. Mm -hmm. God thank bless you. you. Thanks, Congressman Chris, very much. Now let me recognize the gentleman from California, Congresswoman Kim. Thank you, Chairman, for having me. You know, sometimes missions are delivered under cost. In order to incentivize cost-effective development of principal investigator-led missions, should NASA explore the possibility to allow the uh, principal investigators to use underruns and development for research and analysis activities. Um, either one of you can address this or both of you can address this. So that wasn't a topic that we touched on in the report, uh, but we, uh, we clearly talk about the importance of uh, incentivizing both the cost structure of the original proposal announcements um, to and um, as well as uh, uh, operations and implementation of missions, so as to incentivize maximizing that scientific return per total mission cost. Uh, right. Um, so, you know, we didn't we didn't particularly uh, address the topic uh, you raised, but it's an intriguing one. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, Christensen, do you have any input in that? Um, not much, uh, to, to say beyond what Robin said. Um, there have been missions, there have been examples in the past, ones that I've been part of where that was done, where underrun was allowed to be used and carried forward into the science uh, operations phase. Uh, as Robin said, it's not something we discussed, but um, it, it, it certainly is uh, something that uh, sh uh, should be considered. Great, thank you. You know, NASA, it plans on leveraging public-private partnerships to explore the moon. And they've also stated that that will take a more commercial approach. So the question to you both is what customer other than NASA do you see on the horizon that would make this commercial? I'll start, that, that, that's a very good <laughs> question. Uh, it's one that we've, that we've been struggling with as a community for a very long time. I mean, clearly we're scientists, we see the, the scientific potential. Um, I think it's very difficult to say, uh, but maybe it's communications, maybe it's resources, maybe, you know, I think there's a lot of, of potential uh, commercial uh, applications uh, for the moon and, and uh, even for Mars. Um, I think the report, we strongly encourage NASA to continue these commercial partnerships to, to uh, enable this capability and then let the entrepreneurial commercial world uh, take over and, and come up with uh, really good ideas. If I might add one way in that we're seeing um, uh, benefits outside of planetary science already is in launch vehicle, launch vehicle development, right? Because NASA is one customer and we benefit from improvements and reduction in cost, but we're not the only customer. Just getting satellites into orbit and other more distant um, uh, and more efficient ways of reusing, reusing launch vehicles, those benefit science too, even if they're not going to the same place we want to go. Thank you very much for both of you. I know I'm jumping big, uh, back and forth here because I was on another meeting. I just jumped in. But I want to thank you so much for both of you and for the work that you're doing. It's critical and important. And uh, I appreciate uh, all your work. Uh, with that, Chairman, I will yield back the balance. Thank you, Congresswoman Kim. And we're going to do a second round, so you're welcome to stay if you like. Uh, it may just be... Mr. Perlmutter and I, but that's totally fine. Uh, so, so let me begin. By the way, I, I, I want to pile on uh, just editorially with uh, Congresswoman Kim's comments about the commercial sector. Um, I know it's a little harder to figure out because um, they're, they're, they're in the business of making money. We had a hearing a week or two ago on space situational awareness and space traffic management, um, orbital debris, and it's very clear most of the, the 
the discussion was about where on that bell-shaped curve between totally commercial or totally governmental um, should reality lie. I think we'll obviously be in a very different place when it comes to the kind of planetary um, observations that you're trying to do, but uh, good to keep it in mind in any case. They certainly are developing lots and lots of capabilities. Um, to Dr. Christensen, you, you talked about um, is there life beyond Earth and how all these, these missions could contribute to that? Um, is it safe to say we're just thinking about um, organic biology, astrobiology in this solar system? That you're not really expecting to learn anything that's, that's extra solar from this? Well, one of the things that, that we included in the report uh, was the discussion of, of exoplanets. Um, much of that res uh, resides in the field of astronomy, um, but there's tremendous things that our solar system can inform us about looking for life outside our solar, solar system and vice versa. So our report was focused primarily on destinations in our solar system, but we clearly, in the, in the, in the search for life and the thinking of life, you know, how does what we learn here inform our search outside and vice versa? So we, we clearly see this strong interaction between the search for life locally and the search for life in the universe. It, uh, it is fascinating that the old Enrico Fermi question, uh, if there's life in the universe, why do we feel so alone? Where are they? <laughs> uh, so doc, Dr. Kana, um, in looking at the nine themes, you dedicated your life to this planetary science and understanding it. Which is your favorite? So my, my personal area of work relates strongly to that first theme on origins. Um, so that's my, that's my personal, that's my personal favorite, the um, kind of what, what transitions from this disk of gas and dust into a planetary system and what affects that and how much is stochastic and and kind of random in its outcome, and what are the more deterministic pro, um, uh, outcomes that one could predict? Um, there was also a huge as we as we worked to develop those themes and priority science questions. Big questions emerged from the whole committee as we discussed this and we talk about in the report. The um, and this gets to your question to uh, to my co-chair. You know, how does the solar system and our ability to actually bring back samples and study things in situ, how does that provide our ground truth constraints so we can understand more broadly the formation of solar systems in, throughout the universe? That's one theme. Another theme, yes, we know there are habitable environments elsewhere in the solar system, but did they or do they have life? And that wanting to make that step to get to actual life detection in this next decade was a huge priority of this committee that came out in the report. And so that was, that. there's a lot of passion behind that question, I would say. How disappointed will you be if we don't find any signs of life? No fossils, no organic materials, no. You know, I, I think the question of, you know, if you found life, obviously that would be one of the, if not the greatest discoveries of science ever. But now that we know that there are these other environments where we have energy and we have the nutrients and we have liquid water, if we find a complete lack of evidence of life, that's a really interesting question too. Because then the question is, why not? If you had these other environments where you had all of the pieces that we think we understand as being the key things for life and you don't see it, why didn't it emerge? So to me, this is a question that doesn't have an uninteresting or um, uh, an interesting answer, but of course it would be more exciting to see evidence of life. And, and certainly when you look at how many different ways life has expressed itself and endured on this planet, um, you know, if you figure out what that first start is. But by, by the way, I've, I've read that if you get a room full of scientists and say, how many believe there's other life in the universe, every hand goes up. Which is pretty interesting. So. That's true. I think that's accurate. Yeah. I would agree. Let me ask um, my favorite scientist to raise his hand right now, the, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you. So I, I was going to say my favorite of your three topics, your themes, was uh, life and habitability. 
And uh, I'm just, you know, this, all of this stuff excites me. So, you know, here I am a bankruptcy lawyer and, you know, I just love this stuff. And, and when you two are talking about it, it just, uh, I just really appreciate it. So let me, let me focus. Uh, somebody mentioned the Atacama large millimeter array, Alma and Webb. How, you know, I'm thinking of those two things looking deep into the universe and, and knitting together black holes. How do you see them helping you two in, in studying our solar system? Well, I'll just comment. I, I think, you know, my colleagues who work on uh, James Webb, for example, um, have an incredible set of questions of their own. Uh, so I think that that particular uh, observatory will be focused on, you know, big picture questions of star formation and looking deep into the universe. Um, I think it'll be a very long time before that's, you know, applied specifically to planetary questions. But as Robin said, it's, you know, what goes on in our solar system is identical physics to what's going on in other solar systems. And so, those telescopes, those observatories will tell us tremendous amount of information about what goes on elsewhere that is directly relevant to us back here. So you, you have, haven't bought time yet on web or anything like that to study, you know, a, you know, a microscopic thing on Uranus or, or Saturn or something? We've, we've tried, but so far I haven't succeeded. But in the same way that, you know, our solar system because we can get samples from objects, we can, we can learn things about the detailed chemistry and compositional constraints that the astronomers will not be able to access an exoplanetary system. But there's a converse relationship too. The astronomers, they can look at stars that are just being born. They can look at planetary systems that are just being born. They can actually see disks that have gaps in them with a newly born planet in one. So they can give us the ability to essentially look back in time and to tell us what the, what the processes in our early solar system were like. And then we combine those with our understanding of the oldest parts of meteorites and you can start to get a, a more complete picture of how solar systems form and evolve. So they're very complementary. Okay, um, looking back at the last decadal report, what, do you two think uh, we uh, accomplished the best? I mean, what answers or what things did we do to you know, satisfy the, the areas of interest in the last report? What, give, me, give me the successes. As Ruffin touched on at the very beginning of her talk, I think the last decadal was outstandingly successful. Um, again, thanks to Congress and the American public for making that happen. But, the highest priority was let's get started on Mars sample return. We're doing that. The second priority, which many of us thought would not happen in a decade, let's do a Europa uh, orbiter. That's happening. Uh, the New Frontiers missions, of, we've made tremendous progress there. So from my view, it's a, it's a success story up and down the report. Uh, and there's, there's very few things that, that haven't come to pass. In addition, they were the last report uh, really developed, I think, this idea of programmatic balance, meaning not just going to different places, but having different scale activities, small missions that can incorporate more risk and be um, implemented with a high cadence that can be very responsive, all the way up to flagships and everything in between. I think the current planetary program has done a really good job of that. Um, in addition to the New Frontiers program that, that Phil mentioned, uh, the discovery program, I think we've done an excellent job of maintaining that as a high cadence program, very innovative. Here's your cost cap, go anywhere, propose the best science you can imagine and see what the proposers come up with. And that's been a, a tremendous driver of innovation um, in the last decade as well. Uh, you saw the really the development of uh, planetary defense as a substantial effort uh, in this last decade. And the Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program also has developed during this past decade. And the whole development of the commercial sector in terms of providing both launch services and delivery, hopefully, um, to the lunar service on a regular basis. Um, so outstanding uh, uh, set of accomplishments across the board. 
Well, thank you. And um, I'd say to my chairman, you know, we were out to see you a couple of weeks ago with the science committee. We visited the university. I just want you to know whether it's Arizona or Colorado, the West has some great scientists and it's not all on the East Coast, Mr. Chairman, you should come West sometime. Which direction is that? <laughs> anyway, um, go ahead, please. No, no, I was gonna, I was gonna yield back. I just thank you too for uh, working on this report and, and putting it together for us. And uh, um, you know, I'm very excited to see what we do over the course of this next decade. I do thank you, Congressman Perlmutter, and thank you both, Dr. Knup, Dr. Christensen. Uh, really interesting fun hearing, but also extraordinarily important. And thank you for giving so many decades of your life on these decadal surveys. Um, these, you know, there's so many tough things in America today from the, the kids getting killed by guns and the COVID and the division between right and left. And, um, you know, it, it's sometimes hard to stay up. And I'm trying to um, make all my speeches about all the good things surrounding us. Um, you know, the, the 11 and a half million jobs advertised said the 17 states with the lowest unemployment rates in their history. Um, but it will be so much fun in the months to come to talk about the decadal survey for planetary science and astrobiology. Because this is really, really good news for humanity. Uh, so we're to thank you for all of the work you, you've spent putting the, the survey together the thousands of scientists that you had to manage, which I'm sure is difficult. So thank you for testifying before the committee. Formally, let me say that the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may want to ask of our two witnesses. Witnesses, you are now excused. The hearing is now adjourned. And let me just finish with, with great thanks. We are done. Thank you. It was an honor. It was thank very much an honor. Thanks all. We will look forward to continuing to follow your progress in the years to come. Thanks so much.